Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 2.4, Biomes, Zonation, and Succession. We'll examine how climate determines biome distribution, how communities change across environmental gradients, and how ecosystems develop over time. Let's get into it. The key concept for this topic is that climate largely determines what type of biome we find in any given area. This is illustrated in the graph showing average annual temperature and precipitation. Notice how different biomes occupy different regions of this climate space. While climate sets the stage, individual ecosystems within biomes can vary considerably due to local abiotic factors like soil type and biotic factors like the specific species that are found there. Biomes are collections of ecosystems that share similar climatic conditions and can be grouped into five major classes. Aquatic, forest, grassland, desert, and tundra. Aquatic biomes are water-based and they include both freshwater and marine ecosystems. Each biome class has characteristic limiting factors that constrain or limit growth, and they have different levels of productivity, and they have different levels of biodiversity. Terrestrial biomes are land-based. If you look at the world map, you can see how these biomes are distributed globally. Notice the patterns. Similar biomes often occur at similar latitudes around the world. That's their distance from the equator. This is because climate follows predictable patterns based on latitude, which is we're going to explore in just a few moments. Here we see a specific example of an aquatic biome. This slide highlights how aquatic biomes, like all major biome classes, have specific limiting factors, productivity levels, and biodiversity characteristics that make them distinct. For aquatic ecosystems, limiting factors often include light penetration through water and the availability of dissolved nutrients. Forests are biomes dominated by trees. Forest biomes have high primary productivity, but they can be limited by nutrient availability, especially in tropical regions where nutrients are rapidly cycled and primarily stored in the biomass of the trees rather than in the soil. Grasslands are characterized by grass as the dominant vegetation type with just a few trees. These ecosystems receive less precipitation than forests. Their productivity is moderate and it can be limited by seasonal temperature extremes and relatively slower nutrient cycling. Desert biomes receive very little precipitation and they experience extreme temperature fluctuations between day and night. The limiting factor in deserts is primarily water availability and that restricts photosynthesis. Despite these harsh conditions, desert soils can be rich in nutrients due to minimal leaching from precipitation. Tundra biomes are characterized by extremely cold temperatures, short growing seasons, and often permafrost that's permanently frozen ground. Limiting factors include short days for part of the year, low temperatures, and frozen water that restricts plant access to moisture even when it's present in the ecosystem. All of these things limit photosynthesis in the tundra. This table summarizes the specific limiting factors for each biome type. For aquatic biomes, light absorption by water limits photosynthesis, especially in deep oceans. Forests face constraints like nutrients locked in biomass instead of in soil. Grasslands have less precipitation and temperature extremes. Deserts lack water, and tundras face short days and frozen conditions that limit productivity. Looking at productivity across biomes, we see significant differences. Tropical coral reefs and rainforests show very high productivity, while deep oceans and deserts have low productivity. Note how productivity relates to the availability of resources and energy for photosynthesis in each biome. Biodiversity also varies greatly across biomes. Tropical rainforests have the highest biodiversity on Earth, with temperate forests coming in a close second. Desert and tundra biomes typically have lower biodiversity due to their harsh environmental conditions that fewer species have adapted to survive. Let's examine what creates these biome distributions. Insolation, which is incoming sunlight, precipitation, and temperature are the main factors governing where biomes occur. Insolation refers to the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth's surface, and that varies by latitude or distance from the equator because of Earth's tilt. This difference in insulation, combined with differences in how land and water absorb heat, creates the temperature patterns we observe globally. This triangular diagram shows how the interaction of temperature, precipitation, and evapotranspiration determines which biome will develop in which location. Moving up the diagram represents increased moisture, while moving right represents increases in temperature. Each combination of these factors creates conditions that are suited for a specific biome type. 
the tricellular model of atmospheric circulation is something you should definitely know for your ESS exam. The tricellular model explains the distribution of precipitation and temperature globally. There are three cells in each hemisphere that you need to know about. The Hadley cells near the equator circulate warm air. The feral cells in the mid-latitudes circulate moderate temperature air. And third, the polar cells circulate cold air. This circulation pattern creates predictable climate zones and those climate zones influence the distribution of biomes. Climate change is altering the distribution of biomes. This image shows projected changes in tree biomass, grass biomass, and total biomass across Africa between the years 2008 and 2100. Notice the significant shifts predicted, particularly in the map on the right. These changes occur as warming temperatures alter precipitation patterns and they push the climate zones towards the north and south poles or away from the equator. Zonation refers to changes in community structure along an environmental gradient. Unlike succession, which is a change over time, zonation is a spatial phenomenon where you can observe different communities as you move across the landscape from point A to point B. This coastal example shows how distinct zones develop from subtidal channels to the high marsh habitats. Here's an excellent example of altitudinal zonation. As we move up a mountain, both moisture and temperature change, and that creates distinct vegetation zones along the mountain. Notice how ecosystems at higher elevations resemble those found at higher latitudes. Moving up a mountain is climatically similar to moving towards the North or South Pole. It's important to understand the difference between zonation and succession. Zonation is a spatial pattern observed across the landscape at a single point in time. Succession is a temporal change where communities evolve and change over time. The image shows a vertical zonation on a mountainside, illustrating how elevation changes create distinct ecological communities. This significant idea introduces succession, which is the process that leads to climax communities. Succession proceeds through stages or seers from pioneer species colonizing bare rock to increasingly complex communities. The diagram shows the progression from bare rock through various seers to a forest climax community. There are two main types of succession. Primary succession starts from bare rock or substrate with no prior soil development where no organisms have lived before. This usually happens after a volcanic eruption. Secondary succession occurs after a disturbance to an existing ecosystem, like a fire or a flood, where some soil and organic matter remain behind. Secondary succession generally proceeds a lot faster since some resources and nutrients are already present on site. Succession moves through distinct stages over time. Those stages are called SEERS, S-E-R-E. -E. We start with a climax community at the top, which may be disrupted by disturbance. Pioneer species then colonize the area, followed by intermediate stages with increasing complexity, eventually returning to a climax community if left undisturbed for a long enough period of time. During succession, several ecosystem properties change predictably. This graph shows how productivity, biomass, stability, and diversity all change over time following a disturbance. Note that productivity peaks relatively early in succession while stability continues to increase throughout the process. Greater habitat diversity leads to greater species and genetic diversity. This relationship occurs because more diverse habitats provide more environmental niches, and those can support more specialized species. The graph shows a strong positive correlation between habitat diversity and bird species diversity found in Nevada. Species can be classified based on their reproductive strategies and potential. Our strategists thrive in unstable environments with frequent disturbances. They produce a lot of offspring, they mature quickly, and they tend to have short lifespans. K strategists, on the other hand, are found in stable environments. K strategists produce fewer offspring, they grow more slowly, and K strategists tend to invest more resources in ensuring the survival of each offspring. This image illustrates the RK scale of reproductive strategy. On the extreme R-selected end, Organisms like oysters produce millions of offspring annually. On the K-selected end, species like chimpanzees might produce just one offspring every five years. 
These strategies represent adaptations to different ecological niches. These graphs show different population dynamics of R and K selected species. R selected species show large population fluctuations. They often overshoot the carrying capacity and then experience a mass dieback. K selected species maintain more stable populations that hang out near the carrying capacity. The survivorship curves also differ dramatically with R selected species experiencing high mortality or a lot of deaths early in life. In early stages of succession, gross productivity starts low due to the unfavorable conditions and the low density of producers. However, community respiration is also low and that results in high net productivity as the system accumulates new biomass. The graph shows how gross production rises quickly then gradually decreases while biomass continues to increase. In later succession stages, with an increased consumer community, gross productivity may remain high, but it's balanced by higher respiration rates. The productivity to respiration ratio, or P to R ratio, approaches one, and that means that net productivity approaches zero. At this stage, the ecosystem is maintaining its biomass rather than accumulating more. This diagram illustrates how ecosystem stability, succession, and biodiversity are intrinsically linked. It shows the progression from bare rock through pioneer stages to climax forest, with increases in biodiversity, biomass, and soil development occurring throughout the entire process. In a complex ecosystem, the variety of nutrient and energy pathways contributes to its stability. This food web diagram shows 56 species with numerous connections between them. Each connecting line represents energy flow and can be thought of as a supporting structure. The more connections that exist, the more resilient the whole system comes to disturbances. There is no single climax community but rather there's a set of alternative stable states for a given ecosystem. This forest shows patches of different colors representing different communities within what's considered a climax ecosystem. These variations arise from differences in soil conditions, in microclimate, and past disturbance events like storms that may hit one part of the ecosystem and leave other parts of the ecosystem alone. Human activity can divert succession to alternative stable states by modifying ecosystems. Activities like agriculture, grazing, fire management, or deforestation can create what ecologists call a plagioclimax community. A plagioclimax is a stable state that's maintained by continued human intervention. If human activity stops, as in this field in Denmark, secondary succession will begin. An ecosystem's capacity to survive change depends on its diversity and its resilience. Tropical rainforests, despite their high biodiversity, recover pretty slowly from disturbance because most of the nutrients are stored in vegetation rather than in the soils. Temperate forests, on the other hand, often recover more quickly because they have more nutrients in the soil to support regrowth when the plants are cut down. To explain biome distributions, you have to consider temperature, precipitation, insulation, and global air circulation patterns. This diagram shows how these factors interact to create the climate conditions that support different biomes. Note how both latitude and altitude influence biome type due to their effects on temperature and precipitation. Analyzing biome data reveals how climate factors influence flora and fauna adaptations, that's plant and animal adaptations. For example, tundra environments with really cold temperatures and minimal precipitation support specialized plant species like mosses and lichens, and animals that are adapted to cold like caribou and lemmings. Each biome's characteristic species show adaptations to the specific climatic constraints within that biome. Climate change is impacting biomes around the world. These maps show temperature changes from 1901 to 2002, biome distributions from 1961 to 1990, projected biomes for 2071 to 2100, and vulnerability to biome change. Areas with high vulnerability, those are in red, face pretty significant ecological transformations as climate zones shift towards the North and South Poles and upward in elevation or altitude. Soil formation is the foundation of primary succession. This diagram shows the process from weathering of bare rock to simple organism colonization, to horizon formation, to well-developed soils that can support increasingly complex plant communities. Each stage or sear of succession creates conditions that facilitate the next stage. This is an example of a positive feedback mechanism in ecosystems that's actually good 
Succession follows predictable patterns of community change. This progression shows increasing species richness and evenness as succession advances. Pioneer communities typically have low diversity and they're dominated by a few species, while climax communities have higher diversity with more evenly distributed species populations. Various factors can lead to alternative stable states within an ecosystem. This forest shows patches of different vegetation communities coexisting at the same time. These differences might result from variations in soil conditions, maybe some changes in microclimate or differences in microclimate from one side of a hill to another, past disturbance events like fires or storms, or historical contingencies, especially which species happened to arrive first. There are important links between ecosystem stability succession, diversity, and human activity. Human activities that reduce biodiversity often decrease ecosystem stability. Practices that interrupt succession, like frequent clearing, prevent ecosystems from developing the complex food webs that contribute to resilience against disturbances. R and K selected species play different roles in succession. R selected species with their fast growth and their high reproductive rates dominate the early stages of succession. Their ability to quickly colonize disturbed areas makes them really effective pioneers. The K-selected species with slower growth and more competitive abilities tend to dominate later succession stages and the climax communities. This sand dune system provides an excellent opportunity to interpret a model showing both succession and zonation. This is primarily zonation because we see spatial changes moving inland from the shore. However, it also represents succession over time, as younger dunes near the shore eventually develop into the older, more complex communities found inland. From an international perspective, zonation occurs at both local and global scales. The same principles that create zonation along a small transect also operate at continental scales. From a TOK perspective, studying ecosystems requires decisions about which factors to measure. The challenge lies in determining which variables are most significant before fully understanding the system. That's it for topic 2.4, biomes, zonation, and succession. Remember that these concepts help us understand how ecosystems are distributed globally, how they change across landscapes and time, and how they develop throughout the years. Until next time, happy learning.